This is Sovereign Independent Radio on UWS Community Radio and the International Community Radio Network. Breaking the truth. Welcome to Sovereign Independent Radio. Um, tonight's guests are Alan Watts of Cutting Through the Matrix. Uh, we also have Brian Gerrish of the UK Column. And later on, um, we're going to run a bit over time and have Tony Farrell the ex-police intelligence analyst who recently came out and, and said the biggest threat of terrorism was coming from the British government. Um, I'd like to wel- welcome Alan Watts from Canada on the phone. Are you there, Alan? I'm there, yep. Hi, hi. And Brian? Yes, hi. Yep. Um, for those, um, it, it's, um, it's quite surprising, Alan. Um, we meet a lot of people in the so-called truth movement and we you know, we mention your name and it's it, it's quite surprising how few people actually actually know about you and we try and point them in your direction because you know the information you put out is is solid you know and um backed by documents and all the rest of it and um so for those out there who haven't heard you before do you, do you want to just explain how you how you started out on this journey as it were and um yeah what yeah. you do now sure well i should really say that um i grew up in scotland and uh I knew from a very early age that things were just plain wrong. And um, I also re- realized, too, we're in a regimented system, even in school, and everything's regimented from the government all the way down. And I kept wondering why uh, we got this wonderful history of conquering different countries. And I looked around me, and, and I, I thought, you know, very few folk in, their, in this country uh, that, that really own their own homes. Uh, everybody was scuffling for rent money, uh, even the economy was, was rigid. You found that the same starting wages for even tradesmen across the country were pretty well the same, minimum. Uh, right from north to south, it was just the same way. And I realized you're in a fixed economy. This was designed this way. And the guys at the top that do all the statistics and so on knew darn well just how much it would take the average family to live and pay their rents and, and so on and get to work and feed themselves, and, and no more, basically. So it was a fixed economy. And I got into the history books, of course, to find out how the money system was run, and that's when the shocker came to find out, uh, literally, that you're, you're run by private banks, and uh, government borrows from private banks with compound interest. And once you're into that cycle, uh, from then to the present time, uh, it, you can't get out of it. It's compound interest, and that keeps a small minority not only in control of the money, but the guys in control of the money are in control of the whole country. Today, it's international. You've got a small group of people uh, literally running the world and using NATO uh, as their, as basically as their heavy, who go into countries, bomb them out of existence, and then the mates of the, the guys who are the, the major bankers, they end up uh, getting all the freebies, the oil, the diamonds, the gold, and the mineral rights, just like they did in Yugoslavia. So, so it's, it's astonishing. We're run really by a private gang who set up a long time ago uh, to take over the world. This is documented. It sounds crazy. But you go into the writings of Cecil Rhodes, and he basically outlined the whole agenda. And then his group merged with the Lord Milner Society. Uh, Lord Alfred Milner was actually German, and uh, he was a banker, uh, international, and a bunch of international bankers formed with the Cecil Rhodes Foundation the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Sounds awfully uh, legitimate, sounds very governmental. It certainly has a royal charter to exist, but these guys uh, followed on with the same tradition to use Britain as the embryo uh, to take over the world, already had an empire, and they, they wanted to carry on and get the whole world under this particular system, not to help the people, by the way, um, but to hire mainly people from the best universities, mainly Oxford, old families, and to, have, uh, to, to run it like a secret society. And uh, Cecil Rhodes actually said this, we must copy the Jesuit techniques of secrecy uh, like a secret society, because the public shouldn't know what we're really up uh, on about, what we're, we're businesses. And uh, these guys fomented wars back in the late 1800s uh, in their own writings um, uh, written, well, actually, going to the the historian for the group, uh, Professor Carl Quigley, who had their archives there, he got got the archives from Zimmerman, 
Zimmerman was a communist. He was the main communist of Britain. He had the main com- he was the editor of the main communist papers. He was also assistant secretary to Winston Churchill. And then you start to see all these strange associations with people that you never expect to be associated with, like uh, Zimmerman and Churchill, because Churchill were told hated communists. Well, why was his best advisor, his main advisor, uh, a communist uh, who wanted world empire too? And then quickly goes on to say, we work with communists, we work with fascists, we work with people across dictators. And he said, um, eventually we'll have to bring the United States into this, which they did. Um, in the uh, 1920s, they formed the Council on Foreign Relations, and that's just the same branch as the American branch of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. They're a private group. At the top, you have the top banking families, and um, they're taking over all resources. That's what Cecil Rhodes said. We have to take over all the resources and the wealth of the entire planet. And initially, they pretended to be benevolent dictators, in other words, uh, they would share it properly, properly. You don't understand what they mean by properly, uh, less than 90% to themselves. But um, they're one of the biggest organizations in the world today. Every country has a branch of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, all, each British Empire uh, country, the Commonwealth countries, have a branch uh, in their own country um, running the show, all, all working inside politics and outside politics to bring in a world government. It's not a nice, pleasant thing. They, 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 they try to portray it as peace and all the rest of it, but it's really a form of domination. In fact, it's the worst kind of domination you can imagine because most people don't realize that war was declared on them a hundred years ago, and the war is, is, encapsulates and takes from the Communist Manifesto of the ab- abolition of private property, uh, the abolition of the family unit, uh, the rearing uh, uh, and the moral giving to the children by the state. Uh, pretty well all of the Communist Manifesto has been accomplished at the end of the nation state. Well, that's happened too with the EU. So you realize that before even Cecil Rhodes was on the go, this other organization obviously um, was at work on the same agenda before they became the Cecil Rhodes Foundation and before they became the Lord Alfred Milner Foundation. They said, as I say, that they need a bigger country with more resources, more manpower, and a bigger tax base to to finish the job off. And that's when they brought the United States into it. The United States' only job, only job, is to be the taxpayer for the United Nations, the enforcer for the United Nations and NATO. And once that's done, uh, there'll be nothing left in America. They'll be absolutely bankrupt. They already are. But they knew this back in the 1930s, when you read the Council on Foreign Relations um, memos from their meetings, their minutes of their meetings, they had annual meetings, they knew that America, towards the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, uh, would be uh, basically bankrupt and it would maybe last another 20 years after it was declared officially bankrupt before it went under. But by that time, they would have forced the rest of the world under the same world system, and that's where we are today. So it's an ongoing agenda. Um, there are many facets to it. Uh, they have so many organizations under the United Nations umbrella. Uh, most of them are private, non-governmental organizations, and they're backed by the parallel government. Maggie Thatcher calls it the, the parallel government. When she retired, she said, um, now that I'm out of the limelight, she says, I belong to the parallel government. And this parallel government has more power than than the elected government because we're not responsible to the people. She says we can get the the big job done. And she says it's comprised, uh, this organization is comprised of ex-prime ministers, presidents, and top bureaucrats who all already know each other, having been in office. And she said we can get things done faster. That ties in with the main think tank for for the United Nations, which is the Club of Rome. And they wrote back in the 70s that democracy would not work. There were too many competing parties arguing for power, and therefore they'd have to go, they'd go into a post-democratic society, which is authoritarian. And that is the job, of course, of these, the Maggie Thatcher, the Bill Clinton types, uh, and so on, the parallel government. That's what they're doing now. They, they're actually on, the, on the, 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 the trot all the time across the world, going to world meetings, 
advocating unification of different parts. Now, the unification of Europe was first mentioned by uh, Karl Marx. He said, uh, we'll, we'll split the world into three regions. He said, uh, first will be a European Union uh, under a parliament, which in turn would be under a super parliament of the world. And that's the United Nations. He says, eventually the United States and all of uh, the Americas will come into an American uh, region and some of the Caribbean islands as well, which has happened. And uh, they've, been on, they've been pushing for this and integrating steadily now for 15, 16 years. And then he said after that, he says, we'll also have a, a Far East uh, block as well, a region with Australia, New Zealand, uh, China, Japan, uh, all put into the same block. And they would, these would comprise the main three trading blocks of the world. And they could keep expanding. And that's why you see the EU expanding and expanding. They also have an African block. And uh, these, these, these technically smaller blocks of larger countries like Africa will eventually be merged into the, the, the European Union as well. And there won't be the, block, the African block anymore. So this is the agenda. This is what we're living through today. It's a completely controlled society um, where science is supposedly uh, going to rule us all from birth to death under an authoritarian system. And if they don't want you born, you will not be born. You must be born simply if there's a task they need you for. Um, many of the writers that belong to this society have published their memoirs, like Bertrand Russell, who worked with the Frankfurt Group, who gave you your culture, because that was the whole culture industry which he was involved in. And that's the music industry, that's the, the movies, television, everything. That's where we get our culture from. We copy them like monkeys, unfortunately. And we adapt and, uh, to what we see. So we're going through a planned change. We have been for uh, your whole life long. So are your parents. And you don't realize that the major wars we've gone through, even in the 20th century, were fomented and set up and designed from London by the Royal Institute of International Affairs because Quigley goes into that. And he said, even when they were fighting the Boers to take over South Africa because Cecil Rhodes Foundation, Milner, all the bankers wanted the diamonds and the, and the gold, they were, they'd been pressing for already for 14 years with a war with Germany, which they wanted to make into a global war. And the hope of that was to bring out a, a United Nations or a League of Nations, which they did. That's what they did at the end of World War I. And they hoped by that time they would be so war-weary that every, every country would be persuaded to give up its sovereignty and join the blocs. And they tried that, but nobody went for it. The public didn't want it. They liked their cultures. They liked their traditions. And so they went on the back burner for a while, and other members of the same group, like H.G. Wells, who was a propagandist for them, said in one of his own writings, we need another war. They're not ready yet. We need another war to bring them to their knees. And that's why they brought World War II along. We know from... Um, Professor Anthony Sutton and others who've gone into who financed Hitler and Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution is the same conglomeration of bankers and these top uh, politicians belonging to the Royal Institute of International Affairs uh, which have been behind all the major changes throughout the 20th century and the present century. But what's amazing too is that the wars we've had even you know, in, the, in the late 90s let's say with Yugoslavia the World Bank, which is part of the group, because eventually the World Bank has risen up to its top power, and along with the Bank for International Settlements, and that was also do documented by Professor Quigley, who was a historian for this group, and uh, the IMF, uh, again, you can drop the, the top power. The World Bank, back in the early 90s, published uh, what they wanted to get out of, say, Yugoslavia, Bosnia, and they had all the mines put down, uh, all manufacturing put down, and uh, they, they used NATO as a private army to go in there, and they, they bombed, just like they did with Iraq, they bombed all their infrastructure, all their food-making supplies, everything, water supplies, everything. And then, of course, the people were decimated. They came in under the United Nations, and uh, they brought NATO in under Madeleine Albright, and then they divvied up the country to the, to the private bankers for the debt that Yugoslavia now incurred. And every part or small country that used to belong to Yugoslavia